Last question. Go ahead, sir. In recent time, uh, I would probably identify the most recent U.S. election as the turning point for this. And that's, I'm saying that as an American citizen, this is my first time living in Canada. Um, I've noticed that public discourse has taken to elevate fascism as the ultimate evil. And maybe rightfully so. You know, there are many horrific things committed by fascist states in the 20th century. And you see people, you know, like Facebook cover photos, like Bash the Fash. You see stickers on laptops, this machine kills fascists. It is, you know, there's this big, like, backlash against fascism and the horrors that it caused. But in spite of that, you don't see the same reaction to the horrors and the genocide that were caused by socialist and communist states in the 20th century. You do not... You see people who virtue signal endlessly about how horrible the Holocaust was, about how awful these things were, and then just hand wave away the famine genocide of the Ukraine, the Great Leap Forward. They think these things are inconsequential or even necessary sacrifices for the rise of the greater good of socialism or communism. And I personally find that morally reprehensible, and I can't understand where that where that comes in, how you can stand there and be so opposed to this genocide, but say that this genocide is somehow just, oh, it's not a problem. And why do you think that, how do you think that disconnect happens? How do you think people can um, convince themselves of that? And why do you think that happens? It's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I have, my house is covered with, with art from the Soviet era. And I have a lot of reasons for that. Part of it is to remind me of what happened. Part of it is to watch the struggle between the art and the propaganda on the canvases sort of in real time. You know, I'm very interested in that. But I would never decorate my house with Nazi regalia, you know? And, and you think, well, why is that exactly? It's not like I don't know that, that what happened in the communist regimes was utterly reprehensible. Why is it? And perhaps it's not acceptable to have you know, socialist, realist paintings in your house. But it's certainly more acceptable, or it seems that way, than to have paintings from the Nazi era, let's say. So then you think, well, why is that exactly? And I, I think, you know, back in 1918, at the dawn of the Russian Revolution, when Europe was in flames and in ruins and the monarchical societies were collapsing and the Industrial Revolution was in full force and there, were terrible, there was terrible poverty and terrible inequality, the dream of universal brotherhood was a compelling dream, the dream of egalitarianism. And, 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 and maybe, maybe, who knows how much of it was motivated by genuine benevolence. Some, at least. It's very difficult to see that the Nazi, the Nazi phenomena was ever generated by any genuine benevolence. That's very difficult to, to make a case for. Um, so maybe you can forgive the, the socialist, the communist utopians a hundred years ago because they didn't know what they were getting in for. People had warned them. Dostoevsky warned them. Nietzsche warned them. But, but still. And then the other thing, too, is the problem of inequality. It's like the problem of inequality is a real problem, and it doesn't go away. Like, it's very difficult when you walk down Bloor Street, for example, in Toronto, and you see homeless people, alcoholics and drug addicts who are struggling, and the mentally ill who are on the street, and they're in their little domain of hell. It's, it's really difficult for that to not tear at your heartstrings and say, well, isn't the world an unjust place or an unfair place, which it is. And so... You can see the never-ending wellsprings of motivation to support the oppressed. And I, I think the fact that the, the, communist, the, the communist dogma at least had that as part of its initiating ethos is partly what seems to make it forgivable. I also think it's easier for people to identify why fascism is wrong. We can say, look, racial superiority, no. Okay, it's pretty simple, right? It's three words. You can really get it. But, but, but equality of outcome? It's like, that's really wrong. It's really wrong. But it's not so obvious why, right? It isn't, you, you can't just say equality of outcome, no, and have everyone clap. Because it isn't as, well, and that's the thing. It's really difficult to, it's difficult to isolate the pathological elements in radical left-wing thought because they're not self-evidently pathological. Like, there's this old cliche, um, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. It's like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. We have needs. It's like, let's have them fulfilled. And, well, you have an ability. Well, like, manifest it. It's like, 
Well, it doesn't work in practice. In, in fact, it's murderous in practice. And it's a great catastrophe in some sense that it's murderous in practice. So I just think it's, maybe part of it is it's just a hell of a lot harder to learn why it's wrong. That combined with, you know, the genuine outpouring of compassion for the oppressed. And, and which is, like, who's for poverty? No one, right? And, and inequality is a painful reality. It's painful for everyone. You know, even people who are self-righteous about their, their status, let's say, in, in the depths of their soul, the struggling of, the fact of the struggling still rips at them. And so, it's a more difficult lesson for us to learn. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, to those people lined up at the mics, i sorry for leaving you hanging. I'm sure we could go on uh, all night if we had the time, um, but we must call this to a close. I would like to salute you for your patience and your dedication in the face of the noise from outside. Very nicely done. Well done. Yes. As you, uh, as you no doubt are aware, Professor Peterson has written an international bestseller. It's called 12 Rules for Life. There are some for sale in the hall. Now, before you go, let me just say this. You have participated in what I would consider to be an important step in the life of this university. And for that, we should thank you. So thank you for coming, and thank you for your support. Professor Peterson uh, may be the most important intellectual voice in this country today, and I would like to thank him very much for coming. Good night. I, Be safe. I, I just have, sorry, I just have one small thing okay. to say. Hold on. I would, I would very much like to stay and talk with a bunch of you, and I generally do that, but I can't do it today because I have to go back to Toronto, and I'm going to Australia tomorrow, so I don't, I can't do that, even though I would like to, so I have to run off, and then I have to drive back to Toronto, and, but despite that, thank you very much for coming and for being patient and all of that. Yeah. <laughs> Shame on Queens! Shame on Queens! Shame on Queens!
Queens. Shame on Queens. No freedom for hate speech. No freedom for hate speech. It's actually really catchy. It's not even that good, but it's really catchy. No freedom for hate speech. I haven't really chosen where I'm at with him. I've been looking at his points. I've been looking at the protest points, and I'm not really sure. Um, I just think it's interesting that.